Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the second part of our lecture on the study of family and kinship in India. Today we are going to look at the idea of Dravidian kinship or South Indian kinship. As mentioned in lecture 1, Dravidian kinship was a name given by Iravati Karve to the conceptualization of the kinship map in India. We are going to look at what is spectacular about Dravidian kinship and what has made it part of the staple of theory in the West and on India. Here this lecture is divided into two parts. The first one looks at the conceptualization of cross cousin marriage in parts of South India such as Tamil Nadu and uh, Andhra Pradesh. The other part of the lecture looks at the conceptualization of the matrilineal descent group in Kerala especially. The matrilineal descent group as mentioned in lecture 1 is uh, where descent is traced from the mother to the daughter or amongst the women in the descent group. This is a particular conceptualization which found its true fountainhead in the study of Kerala society or Malayali society uh, way back in the 1800s. The study was conducted by Kathleen Goff, a very well known classical anthropologist and led to much debate and contemporary representations. We are going to discuss both classical theory and modern renditions of the same, just like lecture one. Let us begin with the idea of the cross cousin marriage. Louis Dumont well known for his treatise on caste in India by the name of Homo Hierarchicus began his initial study of India in the southern part. His work on marriage and affinity or the relationship of marriage became a foundational text within anthropology. The book Affinity as a Value looks at cross-cultural compar cross comparisons of marriage practices between India and Australia. Here in particular, his focus was on two aspects of marriage in South India. One, the idea of affinity and how it comes through in cross-cousin marriage and the idea of how affinity is itself a value-laden concept. What do, you mean, what do we mean by value here? By value, it means something that has immense importance to the social structure and often forms the basis for practices and morality around it. According to Louis Dumont, the practice of affinity within South India was based on cross-cousin marriage. As discussed in lecture 1, cross-cousin marriage refers to marriage between children of cross-sex siblings. Basically, when marriage takes place between the, between the mother's brother's daughter or with the father's sister's daughter. It can be the other way around as well. The importance of the cross-cousin marriage paradigm for southern kinship has been marked for many decades now. Even today, contemporary studies look at the relevance and practice of cross-cousin marriage. It is not only within classical theory, but in its daily rendition that cross-cousin marriage truly comes alive. For the purpose of this lecture, we will look at how cross-cousin marriage has evolved in relation often to the idea of matrilineal descent groups. Louis Dumont refers to affinity as a particular idea within Dravidian kinship. Here the idea is uh, two or threefold. The first that cross cousins marry across generations, cementing the tie of marriage and alliance. This is critical. Every generation repeats exchange amongst two sets of people. It builds a relationship between two groups and two communities and has manifestation and importance for the rest of the society. This again, please remember, is a model representation of society. It may not be the reality per se, but more of a structural idea of how social practices work. We all know that everyday life is very, very dissimilar to how we theorize about it. We theorize about everyday life drawing from regularized patterns and aspects of practices which are repeated over a period of time. That doesn't mean that there are no distinctions or differences. So therefore, it is important to know that in southern India, cross-cousin marriage helped create the idea of both endogamy or marriage within the community and also a sense of exogamy. 
Endogamy is very particular in the Indian marriage system. We usually practice caste endogamy in India, meaning you marry within the same caste. And exogamy is usually village or neighborhood exogamy where you marry outside your immediate neighborhood. Now village or neighborhood exogamy is usually followed in North India as I discussed in lecture one. In southern India, it is cross cousin marriage makes it important for village exogamy to not work as, as it does in North India. Because when you marry your cross cousin, you might inevitably marry people within the same neighborhood or village. This is particular because it adds another dimension to affinity and alliance in Dravidian kinship. For Louis Dumont, this idea of affinity and alliance therefore works out in two very important ways. First is the way in which kinship terminology is referred to. Therefore, the word maman or your mama is also repeated in two other terms, that of taya maman and mamakarar. I apologize for the pronunciation if it's not immediately correct. Uh, the taya maman is the genealogical mother's brother and the mamakarar is the wife's father or father-in-law. And this is very interesting because both these terms fall under the umbrella term of the maman or the mother's brother. Why is such a peculiarity distinct to the Dravidian kinship system? According to Louis Dumont and later anthropologists, this is a signal of cross-cousin marriage practice. You count in relatives in anticipation of a tie of marriage. This also means that descent is less valid in terms of how much importance marriage is given. Therefore, identifying your future wife's father as a mama or a maman means that you're planning to marry into your mother's brother's family. And this falls back into the cross-cousin marriage principle or where the ego, as I mentioned in lecture one in according to Levi Strauss's conceptualization, marries the mother's brother's daughter. Now, keeping in mind this very critical distinction, uh, Louis Dumont builds on the idea that there may be two types of alliances, affines. One, the virtual affine, and the other, the perfect affine. The perfect affine actually continuously repeats the same relationship of marriage over generations, cementing the tie between two families or two communities. This is very common and often practiced as we'll see in, in the follow, following readings. And the other, that of the virtual affine, is someone who is supposed to be an affine only in terminology and one may not necessarily marry that person. Now, whether the taya maman, the genealogical mother's brother, or the mama karar or the maman fall into this category is up for more and further analysis. But the most important thing that Louis Dumont focuses on is the idea that alliance and affinity remain the bedrock of Dravidian kinship. One of the most important criticisms forwarded against Louis Dumont in this regard is that he does not specifically differentiate between affinity and alliance. How do we do so? How do we think of affinity and alliance in more important and categorical ways? This is something that we'll see as we go along in the lecture. For the purposes of understanding cross-cousin marriage, we have to look particularly at Tamil kinship. Tamil kinship has its own categorization. And here I am provoked to look at the, read, at the, at the study of cross-cousin marriage, which uh, Margaret Travick discusses in her book on Notes on Love in a Tamil Family. The book Notes on Love in a Tamil Family is outstanding in its own way because it heralded a new way of looking at kinship within anthropology. The aim of the book was to elaborate on a system of ways in which kin also think about desire and intimacy, something that structural analysis of kinship had not seen before. One of the biggest drawbacks of structural analysis of kinship has been that they have only and primarily focused on the idea of the structure, on models and ways of being in marriage, of blood ties, of descent, but not at how kinship is lived and mediated. Notes on Love in a Tamil Family by Margaret Travick actually looks at individual mediations of these ties. While there is a structure, there is also an idea of how people think and love and create affection amongst close kids. Travick is very particular about the cross-cousin marriage rule. She analyzes it from the perspective of Louis Dumas' theory and of psychoanalytic theory. Psychoanalytic theory, if you know a little bit, taken from Sigmund Freud and the others, and particularly from Jacques Lacan, looks at the idea of how certain ideas and certain relationships are embedded within our unconscious and play out through intimate relations and desires. 
in that sense, Travick develops a very interesting theory to look at cross-cousin marriage. She looks at cross-cousin marriage from four particular axes. Both the axes, all four exist in opposition to each other. What are these four axes? The first is the relation between the father and the son. The second is the relationship between the mother and the daughter. The third is the relationship between the brother and the sister. And the fourth is the relationship between the husband and the wife. The relationship between the father and the son and the mother and the daughter exist in complementarity and in opposition. Just like the relationship between brother and sister and husband and wife exists in complementarity and opposition. This is a very interesting relationship and it develops on the idea of why cross-cousin marriage forms the bedrock of Dravidian kinship. Let's look at what marks out father and son relationship. According to Travick, in South Indian kinship, the father desires longevity through his son. He aims to pass his descent, his business, his property, his name to his son. However, as the son grows, he seeks independence and freedom from his father. It is part of a generational rule where the son wants to come on to his own and own his own land, have his own family and break away from his father. This tussle of desiring the son and the son wanting to break away forms a very important part of Dravidian kinship. Linked to this in complementarity and also in opposition is the relationship that the mother shares with the daughter. The mother, at the same time, unlike the father, wants to be free of her daughter, whereas the daughter continues to desire the mother. This is interesting because the daughter has to be sent away in marriage as per the patrilineal rule. But the mother wants to send away her daughter and the daughter doesn't wish to go away. She still seeks to be tied to her mother. And this is a very interesting juxtaposition when seen in relation to the father and son. It's also part of a long tradition of Freudian analysis, which builds on the Oedipus complex, a very well-known theory. The Oedipus complex suggests that secretly all boys covet their mothers. And secretly, in extension of the Electra complex, daughters covet their fathers or also covet their mothers indirectly. Such a theory is part of psycho uh, psychoanalytic theory and has informed psychology and psychiatry for many decades, for many centuries, in fact. But what Travick does is use this theory and juxtaposes it with a structural analysis of Dravidian cross-cousin marriage. She says that this tussle between the father and son and the mother and daughter then comes to be juxtaposed onto a cross-cousin marriage system. It's because the daughter doesn't want to be free of her mother she, that she goes back to marry her mother's brother. The mother's brother is the closest symbol of the mother and a resurrection of a tie that she doesn't want to be free of. At the same time, the son wishes to be free of the father and seeks out a relationship further away from him. Similar to these two sets of relationships are the set, two sets of relationship between the brother and sister and the husband and wife. Later in this course, as we come along to study Janet Carstens' study of relatedness, we'll find how the sibling relationship is always constructed in opposition to that of conjugality or marriage. In South India too, the brother and sister bond is supposed to be special and very, very intimate. What Travick suggests is the whole idea that brothers and sisters want to live together and want to be together for the rest of their lives. However, they must be broken and married off to other people in keeping with what we discussed in course one on the incest taboo. The incest taboo makes it absolutely important that the brother and sister marry others. The incest taboo, as we also remember, is linked to the idea of exchange and marriage. If there is no taboo, there will be no marriage. Therefore, the brother and sister must break their sibling bond to marry other people. Therefore, always and forever, the husband-wife bond is in opposition to the brother and sister bond. Yet, they both must exist in complementarity. For Travick, these four axes make up a very beautiful system of Dravidian kinship, which then informs cross-cousin marriage. It's in the desire of oppositions and pushes and pulls that people seek out marriage with close cousins, not close as much as cross. The idea is that you seek to marry into your mother's family because you want to be close to your kin. You seek to marry your mother's brother because you wish to resurrect a relationship that you had with your brother of intimacy, love, and affection. This in no way suggests an idea that may seem like uncomfortable, but is more to do with the idea of a structural rule of marriage and kinship. 
Please remember that we are moving away from structure as we go into the study of Dravidian kinship and aiming to look at how contemporary people live their lives through these rules and ideas of marriage. As we go further into Tamil marriage and kinship, I now bring in the study of Karen Kapadia. Karen Kapadia's book, Siva and Her Sisters, has been a classical anthropological text on women in Tamil Nadu and how they manage their lives through kinning and acts of intimacy and love amongst close relatives. Her article on cross-cousin marriage, published in the Contributions to Sociology, discusses how the practice of matrilateral cross-cousin marriage that we discussed in lecture one impacts and affects real lived relations. I will now go back to one of some of the diagrams that we did in the last lecture to further explain how this happens. As we remember from our exchange on, if you remember your symbols from the last lecture, ego marries elder sister's daughter. The E is actually elder here. Now, this is the most basic form of cross cousin marriage where uh, the ego is marrying the elder sister's daughter or the elder sister's daughter is marrying the mother's brother. Not the mother's brother's son, but the mother's brother. Let's look at how this marriage practice works. Let's stop here. Let's say the last triangle here is ego. This is his wife. Now let's trace the relationships. Ego's father is right here. Ego's mother is right here. Who's ego's father's sister? Right here. Who's ego's mother's brother? Right here. Interestingly, so therefore, the sister here, as you can see, is marrying the mother's brother. This is interesting because, as we said, this is a generational rule. Please don't be alarmed at the thought that a model encourages the marriage between the very elderly mother's brother and the sister's daughter. That is not the case. Ideally, she is the elder sister's daughter. So there would be a generational rule that brings the mother's brother and the elder sister's daughter at the same generation, right? So now let us trace this further. Now mother's brother and how is this man related to your sister? She is related through the tie that is of the mother's brother, but she also identifies therefore her mother's brother in the same generation as her mother, but being younger than her. Now, this rule, according to um, Karen Kapadia, is followed through generations and repeats itself. That's a very interesting idea that this kind of generational rule can continuously repeat itself. It can continuously bind people into marrying their elder sister's daughter. And it also presupposes this tie and linkage of intimacy across generations. This is particularly important in looking at how uh, Dravidian kinship marriages are thought of. Now, to, to bring it back to reality, Karen Kapadia notes that this is, it's not particularly true that the marriage with the elder sister's daughter that is done with the mother's brother is a very common practice. It's not. It is ideal. People prefer it, but it's not something that is commonly practiced. What is commonly practiced and endorsed is actually the relationship the marriage with the marriage with that the ego da, has with the mother's brother's daughter or the father's sister's son this is a common form of marriage that's practiced now what does this entail this is one of the diagrams that we discussed yesterday so it shouldn't be very difficult to follow through considering there are three groups, right?
Now, as you can see, A is giving women to B, B is giving women to C. It's a unidirectional flow. Again, over generations, the same exchange is happening between the three groups. Now, here, if we had to identify ego as this person, then the ego's father is here, the mother is here, the mother's brother is right here, and this is the mother's brother's daughter. Very simple. But just imagine how this flow happens across generations. It's a very interesting way of mapping and continuing the same kind of generational rule. This is known as matrilateral cross-cousin marriage. And, and I discussed this with you yesterday. The important thing about this rule is that this is the preferred rule according to Karen Kapadia. She develops and she sees that at the ground level, this rule is more manifest, is more popular amongst the non-Brahmin castes in Tamil Nadu, especially the caste group she studies called the Thiyas. Now, the Thiyas actually endorse this marriage rule and feel that it's better for women. Why is it better for women? First of all, they marry within their natal mother's skin. So the, um, the beautiful symbolism used to describe this kind of marriage is when the creeper turns inwards. That means when you give a woman back to the group you took her from. It's important and again replicated in the earlier um, diagram that we discussed, that of ego's marriage to the elder sister's daughter. So if you see here, uh, the mother goes from one group, uh, sorry, the mother is sent to this group and then again she sends back her daughter to her brother. It's a way in which the wife givers remain equal to the wife takers. Remember this notion that we discussed yesterday, in the last lecture was where the wife givers are always equal to wife takers in the southern Dravidian kinship system. It is primarily because of this rule wherein the ego marries the elder sister's daughter or if the ego is fem uh, male, uh, if the ego is female then she marries her mother's brother. The same principle is then replicated here as well, though there are three groups involved. But the idea is that you keep giving to the same group and ultimately C gives back its women to A, thereby leading to a point where the girl eventually goes back to her mother's kin. This is advantageous to women uh, in many ways. Uh, Karen Kapadia mentions that such a, such a system makes sure that the girl has protection and happiness. She is not exploited and she is loved by her conjugal family. The conjugal family, after all, belongs to her mother's family and they take care of her and protect her. Uh, modern conceptualizations of the matrilateral marriage, however, are slightly different. So Karen Kapadia notes that as urbanization and different forms of westernization enter Tamil Tiya societies, the notion of the cross-cousin marriage where you marry into your mother's family has slowly eroded because of the conceptualization that girls who marry their mo mother's brothers or their mother's brother's sons actually become more pampered and run back to their parents' family at the drop of a hat. This is a negative idea which is also pushed through the idea of Sanskritization. For all of you who are students of sociology, Sanskritization is a very established concept developed by M. N. Srinivas talking about how the lower castes mimic upper castes in order to be more mobile and move up the caste hierarchy. Sanskritization is a very well-known possibility in India and is actually still practiced across the country. Similarly, in Karen Kapadia's study, many of the lower caste tiyas who actually encouraged and uh, profited from a close kin marriage of their daughters are now moving away from it in order to move up the hierarchy. We'll see how. But before that, it's important to discuss the final rule in cross-cousin marriage which is practiced by the Brahmins in Tamil Nadu. Uh, this is what uh, Karen Kapadia calls is the marriage of the mother's brother's son or father's sister's daughter. So, taking into consideration three groups again, do follow my hand here because it may look similar to the matrilateral cross-cousin marriage but is actually very, very different. As you can see, it is inverted here. So, 
So, three groups again and here if you look at it A is giving to B, B is giving to C, this is the first generation. C is giving back to B, B is giving back to A and in the third generation it is again back to A giving to B and B giving to C. So, here unlike in the matrilateral system the reversal of uh, wife givers and wife takers is particular. So, here the wife giver is actually not equal to the wife taker. Now, let us see this practice of the ego marrying. Now, this is the ego, then this is the father, this is the mother and this is the father's sister and this is the mother's brother. Now, as you can see from this diagram, this is the father's sister's daughter, right? And for her, the ego is the mother's brother's son. Now, this system is followed by the Brahmins here and they actually endorse the system. For them, the distinction between the wife givers and the wife takers is clearly maintained. And this is more, this is closer to the North Indian ideal of the Kanyadan system, where wife givers and wife takers can never be equal. They are always in a superior inferior relationship. This is also important in the sense that it creates this uh, sense of hierarchy and may also lead to the giving of gifts in one direction from the wife givers to the wife takers, just like in the North Indian system. Whereas in the other system of marriage, uh, actually there is a practice of seeking bride prize. If you know a little bit about bride prize, it is actually where the bride's family or the girl's family seeks compensation for her loss to another family. It is similar in many ways, prestations are given and gifts are given, but in the case of bride prize, the boy's family gives, the groom's family gives money and gifts to the bride's family. So, within Karen Kapadia's study, the idea of this marriage, which is known as patrilateral marriage, is more popular amongst the Brahmins. They wish to keep the hierarchy intact. So, when you marry your father's sister's daughter, you are actually going back to the same rule, right? So, this is important in looking at how marriage is conceptualized in Dravidian systems, the cross cousin marriage. Going back to what Karen Kapadia talks in terms of the conceptualization of cross cousin marriage, she finds that the modern desire for educated urban uh, grooms has led to a move away from the more comfortable system of marriage. This has meant that families now seek out grooms from outside the cross cousin group. They seek out professional and working men who may be in the IT sector or may be more educated than their daughters. This comes at a price. As you know, one of the systems of Sanskritization is to mimic the upper caste. And as you mimic the upper caste, the lower caste lose out on many of the practices that they endorse. Lower caste women, especially the Tiyas, as Karen Kapadia notes, have more freedom and are more embedded in their homes, as we discussed. As you move up, you lose that freedom. You become more cloistered and you become women who stay at home and practice parda, and the practice of dowry comes in. So, from giving bride prize, now bride's families give dowry. Earlier, the Tiyas never really sought out grooms. Grooms would come to their home for their daughters. Unfortunately, with the rise of professionalization and urbanization, Tiyas go out to find grooms for their daughters, which also means that it becomes a one-way exchange to facilitating dowry practice. Now, Karen Kapadia is clearly critical of such a change. This is up to you to think of how change impacts intimate relationships. But what is critical here for us to understand is how a model actually plays out in real life and what impact it has on social relationships. This is one of the ways in which um, Dravidian kinship actually comes alive in its discussion, in how it is represented, in how, in how it grows. Next, from cross cousin marriage, we discuss the practice of matrilineal kinship. So, we are back to the question of the matrilineal descent group. Now, as mentioned in lecture 1, the, U, the idea of the unilineal descent group as discussed by A.R. Ratliff Brown is when it descent and social structure is traced through one sex. It can be the men or women. The matrilineal descent group interestingly is where descent is traced through women. 
For a long time now, the matrilineal descent group has been a source of great interest. There are very few matrilineal societies across the world and this is primarily because of the idea that matrilineal eventually disaggregates and gives way to nuclear households. The same happened in a very interesting way in the society in India amongst the Nayars of Kerala. The Nayars of Kerala have been a source of great study and discussion. A parallel study from the Nayars was done amongst uh, in the northeastern tribes where also some remnants of matrilineal still exist. But first let's understand what the matrilineal descent group is. David Schneider who will do in detail in the next lecture uh, discussed and developed a book on matrilineal kinship where he discussed what matrilineality and matrilineal entails. For him matrilineality depends on three very important factors. First, women are in charge of children and their care. Second, authority is vested in men. And third, the descent group always practice exogamy. Now as mentioned earlier, exogamy is the idea where people marry outside the group. For a matrilineage, to function properly, its women should marry outside the descent group. But the children that they give birth to belong to the matrilineage. Now this is a very interesting idea and an interesting concept as opposed to the idea of patrilineage. Let us just understand how patrilineage and matrilineage differ in one very basic idea. We will come back to it later as we discuss matrilineage. Patrilineage depends on the idea of the in marrying affine, mainly women who will marry and come and live with the patrilineage while men pass down name and property through men. In effect, the children and the women belong to the patrilineage. So it's easier for the patrilineage to thrive in many ways. Women in the patrilineage always marry in a system of uh, residence, marital residence, known as a uxoral locality, basically where the man and the woman shift and live in the man's descent group. However, in matrilineage, this idea of the in marrying affine is very problematic as we will see because here the in marrying affine is the man and interestingly and unlike the patrilineage where authority, residence, descent, everything is vested in men, in matrilineage a, a descent and property is vested in women but authority is vested in the men. This poses some significant problems as Schneider talks and discusses further. So first let us look at this idea that women should take care of children. That basically means that there are three types of mothers within the matrilineage. lineage. The first who is responsible for the care of the child and in its early infancy including breastfeeding and caring for the child's upbringing and growth. Second are those women who actually care for these children. These may actually be nannies or ayahs as we often know who take care of the children of the infant child. And the third woman or mother is through whom the child seeks affiliation into the matrilineal descent group. These three different forms of motherhood are very critical to the matrilineal descent group. They may be vested in the same woman or they may be vested in three different women. That is possible, yes, because the responsibility of the child may depend on the mother who gave birth, the care of the child may depend on another woman who actually is the nanny of the child and thirdly the child might trace descent through a grandmother. This is an interesting idea that adds to the dynamism of the matrilineal descent group. However, the men occupy a very interesting space here as well. As mentioned earlier, authority is vested in the male figure. So ideally according to Schneider, the male figure who takes up authority of the group is the mother's brother, usually the eldest mother's brother. Now the eldest mother's brother takes care of both the women in the household and their children. He controls them and he takes care of the coffers, even though descent is passed through women. This is critical to the understanding and the split in the division of labor in the matrilineal descent group. It is also a very sexual division of labor, which is also seen in case of the patrilineage, but has a very different kind of an impact. If you know a little bit about the sexual division of labor, uh, the Marxist scholar Frederick Engels discussed the sexual division of labor in terms of how private property gave rise to the distinction of how women stay at home and take care of children and their upbringing while men go out of the home and work. This sexual division of labor has also marked centuries of difference between the sexes that women must stay at home and men must work outside and bring in the money. 
this sexual division of labor also marks kinship systems. They are not alien to it. So the matrilineal descent group therefore has this interesting juxtaposition of the sexual division of labor where the men are in authority and in power and the women must take care of the children. Now it's not as simple as it seems because ultimately the men taking care of the descent group and the women taking care of the children are brothers and sisters. They cannot have children together because of the incest taboo. We discussed it in lecture one. So ideally to have more members attached to the descent group, the women must forge out and marry other men. This brings in its unique problem. Who should these women marry? What, what kind of men should they marry so that the children are retained within the matrilineal descent group? Ideally, the women should marry men who also belong to matrilineal descent groups. But then there is another problem. If the men are marrying women from different matrilineal descent groups, where do the children belong? Do the mother's brother children also belong to the matrilineal descent group? Ideally not, because the rule says that descent is through women and not through men. But this is an interesting paradox that the system poses. Schneider therefore comes to the conclusion that besides women, men too are of two or three different types within the matrilineal descent group. The first is the man who exercises authority, usually the mother's brother. The second are the men who are going to succeed to that role of authority after the incumbent authorial, uh, the head of the household dies or falls ill. And the third group of men are those who will never take over that role of authority. It's the third group of women that the matrilineal descent group is not too interested in. And it's the third group of women who actually go and marry other women of other matrilineal descent groups and help them have children, uh, which is then added to their respective matrilineal groups. It's an interesting paradox and an inter interesting representation of a system which Schneider discusses at length. Again, just to tell you, this is a model and we will see how this model of understanding a descent group actually works in real life. So if Schneider looks at three sets of women and three sets of men, what happens to the system of matrilineal descent group in terms of conflict and segregation? Because for Schneider, this is a system complete with conflicts. The conflict is amongst men, the conflict is amongst women, and how it survives becomes a critical question. But the most important question within kinship and the study of the matrilineal descent group is in how the matril is is the question of how the matrilineal, matrilineal, sorry, matrilineal descent group may be a mirror opposite of the patrilineal descent group. Schneider asks, is that true? Is it that the matrilineal descent group and the patrilineal descent groups are exact opposites? Are things reversed just like in the mirror? That is not necessarily true. In the patrilineal descent group, as I mentioned earlier, the in-marrying affines are women whose roles are very clearly defined. They rear children, and they give birth and rear children for the patrilineage. Here authority, descent, property is vested in men. And the women must come in and live with the patrilineage. Making conflicts and other kind of fissures a little less because the men exercise control. And the women take care of the home. In the matrilineal descent group on the other hand, the conflict is often exacerbated because there may be two men fighting for authority. One, the existing and the incumbent authorial figure in the matrilineal descent group and the other is the in-marrying husband. In many cases, the in-marrying husband may seek to usurp power or may seek to break away from the matrilineal descent group with his wife and children. This is critical because it means a deep vision of authority and power. It may often leave the matrilineal descent group in shambles because the women are not necessarily fighting amongst themselves, but the in-marrying male and the incumbent authorial power are. The patrilineal descent group, on the other hand, doesn't face such conflict because women are not there as external entries, but necessary to the patrilineal descent group. They've been married into the group and they don't pose any threat to it. But unlike the matrilineage, in the patrilineage, women are essential for the patrilineage. If there are no in-marrying wives, there will be no children and there will be no membership. Whereas for the matrilineage, the role of the husband and father is something that is not important at all. All they need are children that can become members. The husband and the father might actually pose a huge problem to the authority and structure of the matrilineal descent group. In such situations, 
many matrilineal descent groups encouraged the practice of visiting husbands or men who were away at war or were traveling mercenaries and were married fleetingly through to women in the matrilineal descent group to facilitate the birth of children and the addition of membership to the group. In this way, the mother's brother retained his power of the group. Also, remember the third group of men in the matrilineal descent group, those men who did not aspire to power but were allowed to marry women in other matrilineal descent groups. These men would marry those women but come back to their sister's group. They did not stake a claim on their children which belonged to another matrilineal descent group. So the idea of male conflict here was diminished. However, the interesting thing is that such a system working in, in a largely patrilineal and patriarchal society found it difficult to survive as we will see in the Kerala case. But in this case, it became important to understand how such a system exists. Before we just go to the Kerala case, I want to take a slight, uh, I want to digress a little bit and uh, talk about the Khasis in Northeast India. Uh, a group uh, that has been studied by the sociologist Tiplut Nongbri, who are also matrilineal in character and in practice. Amongst the Khasis, Tiplut Nongbri believes the idea of matriliney is only on paper. It does not give women any kind of power or, uh, or privilege. How is that possible in a matrilineage? As we can see, authority is vested in men. So power and authority is still executed by the men, not by the women. The only thing that the women have is the passage of property and rights. Now, uh, amongst the Khasis, interestingly, this becomes even more acute. According to Tiplut Nongbri, in a Khasi household, usually the youngest sister stays back to take care of her mother and the other matrilineal household. She also stays back to take over and take care of any brother who refuses to leave the group. In amongst the Khasis, the men can move out and figure out their own lives and marry and go live with their wives group. But many of them stay back and may not work, which means that the sisters have the added responsibility of aging parents and brothers who are unwilling to contribute in any way to labor, household labor or labor that is linked to the household. However, uh, strangely enough, Power and political power and public power in the public domain is again vested in men amongst the Khasis, whereas women are restricted to the household, which means that power regarding finance, regarding decisions about the household are again taken by men, whereas women have to fulfill the major roles of motherhood and taking care of children and the household within the domestic domain. Now this is particular because the matrilineal descent group seems to be disadvantageous to women while at the, same being uh, at the same time being represented as advantageous. One of these advantageous representations becomes the key node of analysis in anthropology. Uh, in Kathleen Gauss' analysis of the Nayars of Kerala, matrilineal descent groups are represented in a more romantic and often in an oriental way. Uh, she is almost dreamy about the system and in her great uh, descriptions of the matrilineal descent group of the Nayas, she almost makes them out to be utopian, where women have great sexual freedom. But the truth is that she represents this group before the coming in of the British. With the coming in of the British and colonial rule in Kerala and Malabar especially, where the matrilineal descent groups of the Nayars existed, the slow dissolution of the system is evident. We'll see what happens later. But in Kathleen Gauss' beautiful yet problematic description of the Nayars, the matrilineal descent group is almost represented as this beautiful mirage where women can do what they want, which is not exactly true. So how does Kathleen Goff represent the Nayars? The Nayars especially, as you can see in this image, lived in a, a household uh, called the Tarawar. The Tarawar were big households and neighborhoods of matrilineal communities. There are two images here. Some of them still exist in Kerala. And they, have, uh, they had more than three or four families living together. The Tarawar was a representation of the matrilineal group in unity and living together within this space. The Tarawar was also where uh, women pass property through, the, through, through their daughters and also where the mother's brother exercised control. Very similar to how Schneider describes the model of matrilineal descent groups. In the Taravar, interestingly, the mother's brother, who was the authority figure, was known as the Karnavan. The Karnavan uh, exercised control in terms of money, in terms of how the household worked, 
and exercise most important control on the sexual and reproductive rights of his sisters without actually marrying them. He was in charge of making sure that they married or had sexual relations with other men and then their children would come back to the household. This is an interesting system that Kathleen Gao discusses in relation to the other caste group in Kerala uh, known as the Nambudri Brahmins. The Nambudri Brahmins were patrilineal as opposed to the matrilineal Nayars and had a very strict system where the in-marrying affine would be the woman who would come and live uh, with the male kin who passed property through men. Uh, but the Nambudri Brahmins had a rule wherein the eldest son had to marry and procreate for the descent group. The other sons were allowed to have relations with women who belonged to the Nair, Nairs and uh, the Nair group, the matrilineal group. This was a very comfortable situation where uh, the other Nambudri men would facilitate the birth of Nair children, whereas the eldest Nambudri man, uh, you know, re respectfully developed the Nambudri clan. This system of symbiosis in Kathleen Gao's very romantic rendition of Nair society worked through and was often worked very well within the social system where Nair women could have more than one sexual partner. She makes a big deal about it, making it utopian and almost feminist in its representation. Uh, and Nair women would begin their sexual life through the ceremony of the Tali tying ceremony which was enacted at the puberty as a, as a puberty ritual for the young girl who reached puberty in the Nair household. She would be symbolically and ritually married to a man and this was the beginning of her sexual and reproductive life. Every children born to her, every child born to her, sorry, would then belong to the matrilineal descent group. Now such a romantic rendition of uh, Kerala Malabar society uh, is, de is, is developed by Kathleen Gao and remains embedded in anthropological analysis and understanding of uh, matrilineal descent groups for many decades to come. In fact, Kathleen Gao's study marked the understanding of matrilineage and matrilineal uh, descent groups in anthropology worldwide. It was flawed, it was meant to represent something that was also very colonial without actually developing a nuanced idea of how women actually lived in these societies. Uh, Kathleen Gao used textual reference to, references from uh, pre-British India to develop an image of the Nair household. However, contemporary al analysis from varied sources and very well-known anthropologists such as John Key Abraham and um, such as John Key Abraham looks at how this system of the matrilineage is not as simple as it seems. The book by G. Arunima, which is an essential reading, looks at this particular image known as There Comes Papa. This is an image which was painted by the very well-known artist Raja Ravi Varma and shows his daughter uh, and grandson waiting for the invisible father. In many ways, this painting is representative of the dissolution of the matrilineal system, of the dissolution of the Nair matrilineal system most importantly. And John Key Abraham and G. Arunima use this image to actually discuss how finally the matrilineal system comes to be undone in Kerala through legal reforms or what are known as legal reforms. In John K. Abraham's study of the matrilineage, she looks at non-Nayar castes to look at how this, the idea of the matrilineage works. She discusses how uh, legally uh, in, seven, in 1896, the Malabar Marriage Act is the first law passed towards the dissolution of the matrilineage. And finally, in 1976, the Kerala Joint Family Abolition Act does away with the matrilineage completely. This is a sign of how the matrilineage dissolves into nuclear households and to more acceptable practices, socially acceptable practices. And here acceptable is in quotes of course, uh, socially acceptable, acceptable practices of patrilineage, where the in marrying affine is the woman and the man retains control of the household. But in a study of the Thiyas, who are another matrilineal group belonging to a lower caste, she finds that the idea of the in-marrying man was never really practiced. They were a matrilineage group, but the woman always married outside. She went to live with her husband, yet she inherited property through her mother. This is critical because in the, in the, in the analysis of the Thiyas in Kerala, John K. Abraham brings in the complexity which is obviously missing 
uh, in Kathleen Goss, beautiful rendition but problematic rendition of the Nayas. What John K. Abraham brings in is more nuance and an understanding of how the matrilineal descent group is not in stuck in time in this rendition of, a ma of women living and men leaving. In fact, the matrilineal descent group is dynamic and despite ab abolition still exists in very different forms. So as she studied the Thiyas in Kerala, uh, Janki finds that many of the Thiyas practice uh, what is known as viri locality or where the woman goes and lives with her husband. And in this case, uh, this practice uh, develops also this idea of the providing husband. As we, can, as we go back to the understanding of uh, matriliney and patriliney, we also develop the sense of how patriliney depends on the idea of the man as the authorial figure and as someone who also is vested with money and power to take care of his children and wife and of the descent group. This is played out also in case of the matrilineage. As Abraham notes, the Tiyas are actually a group which pass property through the women but continue to have a specific role for the man. Here the man is and will always be the providing husband. Therefore, one of the important criteria here is for the man to showcase that he can take care of his wife. He is economically able. In this system amongst the Tiyas, therefore, the question of the man not being able to provide becomes a part of an ongoing trope within the analysis of the Tiyas. John K. Abraham notes, that many of the men would seek help from their matrilineage in turn. They would go back to their sisters, seek economic help, but it would always be hidden under this larger desire to showcase men in authority and in control. Here the role of the women and the man is again in conflict within a systemic desire to adhere to certain idealized representations of how men and women should be and how their roles should be constructed. In the article, which is very interesting, Abraham dis discusses this particular case of an elderly woman who is now widowed and who remembers how she had to fight with her now deceased husband uh, for rights within the household. She earned, and, uh, she earned money through sewing and also inherited money through her parents as part of the matrilineage, but was always made to believe by her husband that she was subservient to him. As part of the sexual division of labor where women are restricted to the domestic domain and men in the public domain, both sets of men and women have to adhere to certain ideals. Men have to forcefully adhere to the ideal of being a provider or else their masculinity is called into question and women are forced to adhere to the idea of, a, of the domestic domain as carers of children and mothers, otherwise their femininity is called into question. It's important to understand that none of these things exist without certain socially sanctified practices and structures of inequality. Therefore, the providing husband and the idea of the providing husband becomes both a problematic idea for a man as well as a problematic idea for women. So it's not only that the man must provide, but that his wife should protect his desire for providing. This becomes an ongoing conflict between the matrilineage and is then developed further through the idea of how the matrilineage may or may not uh, struggle through these ideas. In John K. Abraham's analysis, therefore, the matrilineage is very, very powerful and very, very dynamic, something that Goff and Schneider try to capture but are unable to do in the way Abraham does. This is also essential in understanding how the matrilineage uh, comes to be within society. It has its own particular character, but it also has within it underlying conflicts and seepages. The patrilineage is no different. It too hides and masks many different kinds of conflicts. When we study North Indian kinship, the patrilineage will come into focus much more because patrilineage and patriarchy are stronger in North India as, rather than that's not to say that they're not strong in South India, but their strength and structural influence in North India is more. In this case, matrilineage and its study is also an image perception of how women and men manage their roles within kinship. This is also a key to understanding how society marks the way in which we think about descent groups and lineage groups. We are in the process of developing larger ideas now and as we enter deeper into Indian sociological and uh, thoughts of descent and marriage, we are now developing a notion of how India looks like 
in terms of a kinship map as well, remembering Kira, Iravati Karve here. But as we go further into the study of marriage, kinship and descent, we'll see the dynamism of social choices, of norms and of values and their inevitable clash as change comes in, as society progresses and develops and new forms of ideas through modernization and urbanization come in. For today, Dravidian kinship, we will, which we will re revisit later, I would like to say goodbye, see you soon.